if we can. Let's go ahead and but we'll give Janine just a second to get my PowerPoint up. Why don't we give an applause of appreciation for all of the people that are working in our technology aspect of the church. You all know how technology goes. Um, you can come in here and be filled with the Spirit, and then all of a sudden technology does its thing of being non-cooperative, and it's close to putting you in the flesh or giving you a nervous breakdown at church, so we appreciate all that they do. Now, if you will, turn to Ezekiel chapter 9. Ezekiel chapter 9. We're going to read the whole chapter right now as we prepare to receive from God his word for a message I've titled only for those who sigh and cry. Alright, so the whole chapter, Ezekiel chapter 9, if you're using the church Bible, that page is up there for you, because that might be a little bit of a difficult book to find. Alright, I'll begin reading now in verse 1. Ezekiel writes, and I, I might mention that this is a vision so Ezekiel is seeing a vision that of what is going to happen in approximately six years when the Babylonians siege Jerusalem and pummel it and take over. So we're looking at this vision happening about at 592 BC, foreseeing what's going to happen uh, in 586 BC. So Ezekiel, I want to uh, make sure you realize as you're seeing this right now that it is a vision and it won't occur actually until about six years after this vision. Okay? He cried also in my ears with a loud voice, saying, Cause them that have charge over the city to draw near, every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. Okay? So uh, these individuals that um, the Lord is referring to are probably angels, or they could even be um, Nebuchadnezzar's generals that we read about in Jeremiah 39 3 that would be in charge of take, uh, seizing, seizing, seizing Jer Jerusalem. So that's what that is all about in verse number one. And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north, and every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. And one man among them was clothed with linen with a rider's inkhorn by his side. And they went in and stood beside the brazen altar. And the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub, whereupon he was, to the threshold of the house. And he called the man clothed with linen, which had the rider's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And to the others, he said in my hearing, Go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women. Come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Then they begin at the ancient men which were before the house. And he said unto them, Defile the house, and fill the courts with the slain. Go ye forth. And they went forth and slew in the city. And it came to pass, while they were slaying them, and I was left, that I fell upon my face and cried and said, Ah, Lord God, wilt thou destroy all the residue of Israel in thy pouring out of thy fury upon Jerusalem? Then said he unto me, The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is what? Exceeding great, and the land is full of blood, and the city full of what? Perverseness. For they say, The Lord hath forsaken the earth, and the Lord seeth not. And as for me also, mine eyes shall not spare, neither will I have pity, 
but I will recompense their way upon their head. Behold, the man clothed with linen, which had the inkhorn by his side, reported the matter, saying, I have done as thou hast commanded me. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that as the church of God, we welcome the whole counsel of your word. Lord, that by your grace we come saying, Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. So on this day, when we think of a national tragedy, the 9-11 attacks, Lord, we are humbled. And we thank you that there hasn't been anything else like that that has happened uh, to that magnitude for 21 years. Lord, not only are we humble, we are somber. And we want to take this time to examine ourselves, to scrutinize ourselves and our nation according to your holy word. So we pray right now that you give us the power of the Holy Spirit and help us in this endeavor, Lord, that we might hear and be edified. And as we hear and are edified, that you might be glorified by your word, Lord. Thank you for each precious person here. I pray, Lord, a special blessing upon them as they have honored you with their attendance. And all God's people said in Jesus' name, Amen. 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 On the Saturday of the Labor Day weekend, there was a group called Keep California, Make California Gold Again that was hosting four pastors a brunch. And boy, I'll tell you, you know, that's when the heat wave had begun. And it was out in Riverside. And here it is, the Saturday of Labor Day weekend. And they want us pastors to all go out there and meet. And of course, you need to understand that this wasn't a brunch just for the food and the fellowship. This was all about business. Uh, it was an effort to bring pastors together and to unify and be informed about doing exactly what this organization is aiming for to make California gold again. Amen. So I went out there reluctantly. I tried to get Pam to come, but you know, she she didn't want to go out there. She had other things to do. And I'm driving out there and thinking, why? Why am I doing this? But you know, I'm passionate these days about getting around the people of God and listening to them and seeing how God is working in their lives. Um, I'm just to a point where, you know, I, I am eager for answers. I am eager to see where God is working and, and where we might have hope and uh, find momentum. So, of course, it really uh, wasn't that bad. Um, I wasn't going there for the food, just in case you're curious. I want to make it clear if you're taking notes. Uh, I was going there for the information. <laughs> Any more gestures like that, and we'll have to ask you to leave the service. <laughs> but I wasn't disappointed. I was surprised by the individual who touched me the most. It was a woman by the name of Candy Sterling. And this is a woman who, when she goes to pray sometimes in her prayer closet, it won't go for four minutes, it will go for four hours. And as she was talking to us and exhorting us uh, to step up in our faith and in our zeal to try and do something to turn our state around, she mentioned this verse, Ezekiel 9.4, and it hit me like a ton of bricks. Let's look at it again, Ezekiel 9.4. She quoted it with passion, and like I say, it really hit me. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And what I realized is the reason our state and our nation is in the shape it is in is because we as Christians have basically sat around and let it happen. Now, we have put forth some efforts, but uh, for the most part, um, it's not easy for us to, to make change. Uh, basically, all of us are very responsible people. 
And when you're responsible people, that means you have a lot of work to do and you have a lot of things to take care of. So unfortunately, the way our society is and what we have to do in activity just to keep our heads above water, unfortunately, we don't have a whole lot of time to delve into problems outside of our homes and our employment, right? So we really are at a disadvantage. We are much like the children of Israel under Pharaoh's rulership when he made them work harder and collect more brick and more straw and produce more, br more bricks. Uh, um, we're we're kind of like that. Um, we're overly busy. And the acronym for busy is being under Satan's yoke. And so many things that are so important that we're falling behind on, we can't really attend to. <clears throat> but nevertheless, um, we see in the Ezekiel's time, there was a crisis in the nation of Israel, the southern uh, part of Israel, Judah. Remember, there was a break off. There was the northern and the southern. The northern was already taken out into captivity and ceased to exist. The southern... Uh, still had existence 138 years after the northern kingdom was taken away forever. The southern kingdom still existed because they had more righteous kings. You can ask Pam about that. She studied the kings. And God had favor upon the southern kingdom because of the righteousness of their leaders. That's something to think about, right? He extended their reprieve from his judgment for about 138 years because of the righteous actions of the kings. But what can be pointed out is there was this group of people that were totally on board with God's standard of righteousness. They saw all the unrighteousness going on and their result was to continually sigh and cry about the abominations. God was impressed with that. And what God did was God supernaturally put a mark on them that gave them favor when that judgment would take place six years later. That would give them shelter and help when the Babylonians invaded. Does everybody understand that in the text? There was this group of people that, no matter what else was going on in their lives, they were broken over the state of their country and over the wickedness that they had seen. And so God looked upon them, and a lot of people were just blowing it off, paying no mind to it whatsoever. And that's why judgment was coming soon, in six years. But there were some people that felt the same way as God about it. They could not tolerate this wickedness. And thus there was sighing and crying. And God observed every bit of that. Are you following? Yes. And it reminded me again that where we're at morally in our nation is where we as a church have allowed it to go. We have not stood up bravely enough against the, the flow of evil that permeates our society. And we'll see about this. So here's my proposition. Our society is not in peril because there are more people who want evil than who want good. That is not the problem. Our nation is not in decline because there are more people who want evil than want good. It's just the opposite. Most people in our nation want good. How many agree with that? Amen. By far, a far majority of people in our nation want good. So it's not that. It's not because there are more people who want evil than who want good. It is because there are more people who are not defending God's standard of righteousness than those who are. When we start getting down to a frightening minority, that frightening minority that we see in Ezekiel 9.4 is the remnant who are willing to stand for the righteousness of God no matter what. 
Now, when we look out and try and find Christians like that, they're very hard to find. When we look out and try and find pastors like that, they are very hard to find. My wife was just with friends from Oregon yesterday. Where'd you go? The Getty? Getty Villa. Getty Villa. And these two girls, mother and daughter, they were lamenting that there's hardly a church in Oregon worth going to nowadays because the pastors have become so weak and so compromising. And it broke my heart to hear that. And I thank the Lord that they do have a church that preaches the word, but Oregon is in a spiritual malaise. And the pastors are to blame for that. Well, we need to understand how God thinks. And that's what today is all about. It's not about what we think. All right? It's not about what we think. It's about what God thinks. And as we, we postulate this information that we're getting from Ezekiel and, and take it further, uh, it reminds me of a verse that I want to read to you in 1 Peter 4, 17 concerning our problem that we're in peril because there are more people who are not in America defending God's standard of righteousness than those who are. Did everybody get that? It makes me think of 1 Peter 4.17. I want to read this verse to you. It says, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it, be, and if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Do you realize, just like Ezekiel 9, where did God order the six men uh, to start the judgment, it was in the sanctuary. Did everybody see that? Do your homework. If you have a homework assignment, read Ezekiel 9. You'll see that judgment began in the house of God. And it began with the leaders. And then went on. And the only ones who were spared, again, you need to understand this, are those who are so consternated and so broken that God found them constantly sighing and crying because they agreed with God, these are abominations. These are abominations. So Ezekiel's vision gives us essential understanding concerning, first of all, God's attitude toward iniquity. We see in chapters 8 and 9, these visions, vision number 3, Vision of the glory of God. Vision number four, chapter nine. Uh, vision of God's judgment. We see in these chapters God's attitude toward iniquity. And the Lord reveals himself to Ezekiel in the vision. And totally gives Ezekiel an orientation on God's approbation against all that he sees going on. We get a little taste of it if we go back to chapter 8 and look at verse number 17. It says, Then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the what? Abomination. Abominations. Which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence and have returned to provoke me to what? anger, and lo, they put the branch to their nose. That's some kind of Hebrew idiom. I don't know what in the world it means to put the branch to the nose. But I think I'll threaten Pam with that whenever I get mad. At don't get mm -hmm. me angry, I'll put the branch to my nose. <laughs> it's just an interesting thing to say. It sounds like kind of sarcastic or something. If anybody finds out what that means, let me know. They put the branch to their nose. I know it can't be good to put the branch to the nose. Verse 18. Therefore will I also deal in what? Fury. Fury. Mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity. And though they cry in my ears with a loud, with a loud voice, yet will I not hear them. So Ezekiel, before he 
gets this vision, he's getting an orientation from God concerning God's attitude toward the iniquity of this nation. Does everybody follow that? And God doesn't end it there. In chapter 8, he takes it over and basically repeats his antipathy for this wickedness. Look at chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. Then said he unto me, The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceeding great, and the land is full of blood, and the city full of perverseness. For they say, The Lord hath forsaken the earth, and the Lord seeth not. They were living like practical atheists, like God didn't exist, right? Not a good thing. But I want you to notice, when God is conveying his attitude toward iniquity, he does not use light language. He judged that what they were doing in this nation was, he uses the terms abomination and perverseness. He uses those words. It is abomination and perverseness. Perverseness in 9-9, abominations, in 8.17. That's God's language. Now what is abomination? Abomination is something worthy of or causing disgust or hatred. If we've learned anything about God today, we see that there are things that people do on planet Earth that cause Him to be disgusted. That make Him angry. That incite His fury. There are things that people do on planet Earth that God absolutely hates. Yeah. He hates it so much that when he decides to judge, he says, I will not spare, even if they cry. That's how much God hates some things. He calls them, what does he call them? Abominations. What are abominations? Something worthy of, or of, something worthy of, or causing disgust or hatred. Now, if you were on a game show today, and the host asked you to name from the Bible something that God considers an abomination, uh, could you do it? If the music was playing, do 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 do. And you were asked, name something from the Bible that God considers to be an abomination. Could you do it? I would suggest to you that a majority of people walking around uh, the United States of America with their nose up in the air calling themselves Christians would be dumbfounded. They wouldn't even know what abomination means, let alone be able to find it in the Bible. That's how deep our Christianity is in California, in America, and California, and Oregon. Right, First Lady? But God uses it. We saw it in verse number 17 of chapter 8, but now go over to chapter 9 and we see it again. God uses it again in verse uh, number what verse? Hmm? Number four. Four? I thought there was one more. I had a typo on my... Nine? nine? Yeah. I have nine on my notes. But I guess I don't see it in nine. You see it in nine? Oh, eight, nine. Is that what I meant? Let me see. Yeah, it's eight, nine. Thank you, Vanessa or Connie. Who said that? As long as Miguel's being quiet, that's all that matters. <laughs> Eight, nine, yeah. There we go, and 17. Okay, God uses that there. So, oh, now I know why I have this in my notes. <laughs> what God is doing in these verses that I just mentioned is he's generally giving the nature of abominations. And that's what I wanted us to look at. So going back to 817. 
That's what it is. I, I can't even understand my own notes. I'm sorry. If we go back to 817, generally speaking, what are the what are is the nature of abominations? Well, he tells us right here in verse 17, for they have filled the land with violence. Alright? That's part of it. And then we go uh, on to chapter 9 and verse 9. And as we've already pointed out, uh, the city is full of perverseness. Yeah. And the land is full of blood. So what about these abominations, generally speaking? Um, it involves violence. It invo involves the shedding of innocent blood. And it involves perverseness. So if we're going to generally understand why these things are detestable to God, it is because of this. Perverseness, shedding of blood, and violence. And again, people too weak, too cowardly to stand up and stop it. Stuff that is absolutely abominable to God, detestable to God, and nobody able to quell it. And that's why God has to mark those who sigh and cry and preserve them and not spare, but judge everybody else because that is the state of the situation. It seems to be um, unsolvable unless God intervenes. But now we want to get back to the game show host question about can we name anywhere in the Bible can we name anything that God calls an abomination? Sure we can. How about Leviticus 18.22? I've smoothed this out into modern vernacular just so everybody can understand easily. Here's an abomination. Do not practice homosexuality, having sex with another man as with a woman. It is a detestable sin. A synonym for detestable is what? Abomination. abomination. All right? So there it is, as plain as black ink on white paper. What does God call an abomination in the Bible? Homosexuality. What else does God call an abomination in the Bible? Once again, these are ancient things that God was observing um, 3,500 years ago. And so, of course, we, we go forward to modern times and we start finding equivalents in a modern society to these things. Um, but 2 Chronicles 28, 3, it says concerning this king, he offered sacrifices in the valley of ben Hinnom, even sacrificing his own sons in the fire. In this way, he followed the detestable or abominable practices of the pagan nations the Lord had driven out from the land ahead of the Israelites. So what do we see as an abomination? Not only uh, homosexuality, but the sacrificing of babies. Oh my God. For the interests of the lifestyle of the parents. All right? So we bring this out of 3,500 years ago and bring it to today. What we're talking about is we're talking about abortion. God finds that abominable. What else very specifically is in the Bible that God talks about as being an abomination to him? Deuteronomy 22.5. A woman must not put on men's clothing and a man must not wear women's clothing. Anyone who does this is detestable, abominable in the sight of the Lord your God. Now hopefully we're not so superficial in our interpretation of the Bible that we think that God is talking about here that women aren't supposed to wear pants. <laughs> uh, that would be way too superficial of an understanding. Um, as my study Bible says, the command about clothing is not a statement about fashion so much as it is about real confusion of gender, specifically transvestism. So taking it out of 3,500 years ago to today, what does God find abominable when a society gives up on the binary sexes and allows gender confusion to prevail? 
a transgender society is abominable to God. It is detestable to God. He says it very clearly here. A woman is not supposed to pretend she is a man. See it, Deut Deuteronomy 22.5? And a man is not supposed to pretend he is a woman. You are XX or XY, and it doesn't matter how much you want to alter yourself. That's the way Almighty God has made it. Amen. Amen. And we have a problem right now, because we as Christians, we've been sitting on our hands, and our young people are literally being devastated by this that God calls perversion. They are being ruined for life. I want to show you another verse in the Bible that goes along with this. Will you turn to Proverbs 22.15 for me? Proverbs 22.15. I wrote these verses down after I gave Jeanette, Janine my notes so she doesn't have a page number. You just have to let your fingers do the walking through the holy pages and find it. Hold on a second. What did I say? 2215. Look at here. Watch this. This is important for you to know. 2215. As a matter of fact, this is so important for you to know, I want you to read it out loud with me. Yeah. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. Now, the idea that we are letting children, where the God says foolishness is bound in their hearts, make decisions as adolescents about changing their sex and going along with them and letting them do it behind mom and dad's back is absolutely detestable. Oh my God. There are kids going to school and behind mom and dad's back they're being chemically castrated. That's like something out of the weirdest B science fiction movie I've ever heard of, but that's our reality. Chemically castrated. They're being mutilated. Their body parts <coughs> torn off of them when foolishness is bound in their heart. And five years, six years later, they'll probably very much regret that they ever did that and become suicidal. What in the world is going on? Satan has taken over America. And churches that are weeping at this, Satan has taken over our churches. Everybody's talking about, we are a democracy. No, we aren't. We have freed ourselves from God. We are a Satanocracy. Yeah. These things God calls an abomination. These things God calls detestable. These things God hates. And we're letting our children, we as grown adults are standing by and watching them like sheep to the slaughter be ravaged for their whole life. Yeah. Unalterably changed and ruined. By what God has designed them to be. Amen. We may not agree with God, but God says, I'm not going to spare. Amen. When you get to this point, I'm not going to spare. I don't care how much you cry, I'm not going to spare. The only hope you have is that you have my mark on you, and that mark only comes if you sigh and cry. And agree with God that these are abominations. This is not a democracy. This is a Satanocracy. And we've got just a little bit of time to turn it around. What else? Deuteronomy 23, 17 and 18. When you are bringing an offering to fulfill a vow, you must not bring to the house of the Lord your God any offering from the earnings of a prostitute, whether a man or a woman, for both are detestable, or what? Abominable to the Lord your God. Bringing this up to modern time. This idea of money for sex. What are we talking about? We're talking about commercial sex. God ought to destroy our nation for pornography alone. Amen. Commercial sex, sex trafficking, those open borders are all about evil men sex trafficking these poor women. It's abomination, it's detestable. America is running on 
the economy of commercial sex, and it is sickening, it is filthy, it is satanic. There was a time in American history where you would be put in jail if you even sketched the picture of a sex act between a man and a woman. Now pornography is seen as free speech. Are you kidding me? Do you think George Washington and Ben Franklin, when they sat down and talked about freedom of speech, they were thinking about online pornography? Are you kidding me? Don't be stupid. Don't be fooled. People went to jail for sketching out images in the good old days of America. This stuff, this stuff is obscenity. And we as adults and Christians, we need to stand up and say that we must reinstate obscenity laws and outlaw pornography and all commercial sex in America. Amen. No more prostitution. God says it's abominable. It's filthy money. No more pornography. No more prostitution. No more sexualizing our kids as five-year-olds in school through sex education, which has now become pornographic. When we go to the school board meetings to protest the images that our kids have in the books, these kids are seeing it unfiltered, but the adults are so offended by it, when we show it to them in the school board meetings, they blur it out. Because their poor adult virgin eyes would never allow something like that to be seen in the school board meeting. But it's shown to our grammar school children. You see why God's going to judge? And so first of all, God's attitude towards iniquity. We see that. But next we see God's appreciation for his remnant. We've already looked at it, but let's look at it again. Ezekiel 9.4. Let's read it out loud. This is so beautiful. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. God's appreciation for his remnant. When we agree with him, when we sigh and cry, God looks down and God gives us a special mark. A special mark. A mark on our foreheads. The most prominent place, especially if you're a Burns. When you're a Burns, the most prominent place on your body is your forehead. What are you laughing at? You're a Burns too. After service, everybody gets to set and have you pull up the bangs and identify yourself. What are you laughing at? You're married to a Burns. You girls are on the same uh, short lease as Miguel. If I see you laughing at my forehead one more time, I'm going to have to ask you to leave the service. Especially you, you're an in-law. <laughs> Where was I? Good night. Oh, the most, yeah, we were talking about the most prominent place. Well, that big guy's not laughing. Um, wow, that's how much we mean to God. We are in agreement with his standard of righteousness. He pays attention to us. He has appreciation for his remnant that there were six angels that went to destroy, but before they went to destroy, there was one dressed in linen. And he had an ink horn, a writing kit. What is a, an ink horn, a writing kit? Well, it was like a flask with the ink and then an instrument to put that mark on our foreheads. Of course, it's all figurative. This all happened behind the scenes invisibly. But the idea is the mark is there, right? How many of these perilous times wouldn't mind being marked, being marked by Jehovah on your forehead Amen. as his special people? That sounds like a good thing to me. I'm all in. This is one time where I want to receive the mark. Amen? Amen. But to show you how that works, if you turn to Psalm 31... Now, don't let anybody wig out. I'm bringing a bad boy sermon today. But you need to understand that I was the pastor here 21 years ago when we were attacked. 
And it's not an easy thing to respond to a community when you're a pastor in the community after being attacked. It has a deeper cut into my, the innermost of my being than perhaps it does you. Because people were looking to me for solace and answers that I didn't have. It was traumatic. And so, of course, I'm not going to come in here uh, being cast for milk toast on 9-11 day. You're just not going to find that in this preacher. Most pastors are wimpy. They are part of the problem. Judgment must begin in the house of God. But hopefully that isn't my problem. That I'm going to shun the warnings of God's word just to make people happy. But anyway, concerning this mark and this divine protection, it's so beautiful. Psalm 31, find verse 19. Oh, how great is thy goodness, which thou hast laid up for them that what? Fear thee, which thou hast wrought or worked for them that trust in thee before the sons of men. Just like those people in Ezekiel 9, 4 we've been talking about all morning long. Look at verse 20, watch this. Thou shalt hide them in the secret of thy presence from the pride of man. Thou shalt keep them secretly in a pavilion or a shelter from the strife of tongues. That's our God. That's his divine protection when you have the mark on your forehead. Amen? Amen. G. Campbell Morgan says this about Ezekiel 9.4. In the most corrupt conditions, God has never been without a remnant of loyal souls. They dwell among abominations, but have no share in them. They live in perpetual grief. They vex their righteous souls from day to day. They sigh and they cry for the abominations. When the whirlwind of the divine fury sweeps out from the divine presence to make an end of the appalling corruption, it does not touch them. They are marked by the man with the inkhorn and are exempt from the blast of divine wrath. Then he quotes this guy named Dr. Davidson. Not Dr. Phil, Dr. Davidson. And this is interesting. Listen to this. This is interesting. Drew, listen to this. You might want to uh, take this a little further for me. I don't have time. Dr. Davidson has pointed out something in connection with this oracle, which for us today is full of suggestiveness. That's why I said that to you, Drew. It's full of suggestiveness. And you too, sis, because you have a, a Hebrew um, expertise. He says that the word mark, which we see translated set a mark, is the Hebrew word tav, which is the last letter of the alphabet, and the old form of it, way back when, before the Hebrew language kind of evolved, the old form of it was a cross. Think of a tav, like a T, and he said the old form of the tav was a cross, Brother Andrew. Those today who sigh and cry amid prevailing abominations are surely those marked with a cross. Isn't that interesting? Amen. Now back to Ezekiel chapter 9. We see God's appreciation for his remnant. So beautiful, so clear. But conversely, those who do not come to this place of agreement with the righteous fury of God and join in the ranks with the remnant, those who do not agree with God and His righteous fury, they might as well take a number and get in line because they will not be spared. They will receive no divine favor when God's judgment comes. They don't want to join in the ranks of the remnants and sigh and cry for abominations and stand for the righteousness of God. They might as well take a number and get in line because God is not going to spare that kind of person. Amen. Look at verse number five if you don't believe me. And to the others, all the others, he said in my hearing, go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye what? Okay. So today is the day of uh, today is the anniversary of 9/11, and uh, as we <coughs> seek to wrap up these thoughts, 
I, I want us to use this day as being very illustrative of how much we need God's divine protection. What I want us to do just for a moment, if we can, is I want us to juxtapose the attack of Pearl Harbor, which is, was December 1941? Yes. Hmm? Yes. 41, right? Yes. Right. Yeah. So, uh, 41 and then 9 11, 2001. Hmm. All right? We want to juxtapose these two attacks because I believe these attacks illustrate to us how vital it is that we have the supernatural protection of Jehovah upon our nation. Mm -hmm. Consider this. The Pearl Harbor attacks resulted in 2,403 deaths. The 9-11 attacks resulted in 2,997 deaths. What created more deaths, Pearl Harbor or 9-11? 9-11. Yet, the Pearl Harbor attacks involved 40 torpedo planes, 103 level bombers, 131 dive bombers, and 79 fighters. For the Japanese to kill 2,403 Americans, it took them 353 airplanes with skilled kamikaze type pilots. Are you getting the numbers? Yet more people died on 9-11 with four passenger airplanes, not 353 military airplanes equipped with bombs and bullets. Four passenger planes opposed to 353 Japanese military planes. Four passenger planes killed more people with just 19 Islamic militants involved, and get a load of this, box cutters. Are you kidding me? 2,403 killed with bombers and fighters to the number of 353 in the arsenal, and yet 2,997 killed with passenger planes and box cutters. Mm -hmm. What is God telling us? You go from 41 to 2001 and keep getting farther and farther away from God, and it'll take less and less to bring you to your knees when God takes his hand off your nation. Less and less. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. 9-11 and COVID are just warning shots. We better get serious. We better want the mark. We better sigh and cry. As adults, we better covenant together to stop these abominations in our country, to defend our innocent children. We better get honest. We better figure it out because it is on us and we've allowed it to happen and our children are the victims. Anybody who can see what's happened in our country and read Ezekiel chapter 9 that isn't somber by this all, sobered by this all, that is a person that basically is hopeless. This person who is not sobered by the stuff that we are looking at either is an atheist or is a person who is like cattle headed for slaughter. All they do is take it all in that's all cattle do is they take it all in, but they never look up as they head to the slaughter. Well, lastly, we see what we've seen so far is God's attitude toward iniquity, God's appreciation for his remnant, and God's assurance of his glory. We see from the book of Ezekiel, the Jewish people who had God's glory dwelling among them, didn't seek to glorify him by obeying his will, so he received glory by punishing their sins. God is always going to receive the glory. 
we will either glorify him by or obeying his will, or he will glorify himself by punishing sin. Intend it. The world is now entering into that phase of the manifestation of God's glory being revealed by his punishing the world's sins. Like I say, think about 9-11, think about COVID, the warning shots have been fired. So as we wrap up today, what is, as believers, what is the most primary basic thing we can do at this moment going forward? As believers who sigh and cry, what is the most basic, simple thing we can do that is so accessible and so simple to us? It is to vote out every one of these wicked men who are in political office, who are perpetrating and imposing these abominations on us. Amen. I mean, clean them out. Amen. I mean, with a vengeance, pummel them out of office. That is the most basic thing we can do, and that's why you need to access biblical voter. Last night I was with the lieutenant governor of the great state of North Carolina. How many have seen him on television before? Big Mark Robinson. He's a wonderful man, and he was in Pasadena speaking last night, and you would think you were listening to a preacher. He's the lieutenant governor of North Carolina, and he came all the way out here to Southern California because he knows that Southern California is dying spiritually. And you know what he told us to do? He told us to put our man pants on and vote out the likes of people like Gavin Newsom. Amen. Get him out. Amen. Amen. He is part of the Satanocracy. Vote with joy to get that wicked man out of office. Amen. He needs to be pummeled. Amen. Do you know Gavin Newsom, when he was the mayor of San Francisco, illegally officiated gay marriages, and he still brags about it today. Yeah. Illegally performed gay marriages as the mayor of San Francisco. He's not the friend of Christianity. He's not the friend of the Bible. He's not the friend of God. And we need to do the most basic thing. If, we, if you allow, if you enable these men who are imposing and perpetrating abominations before God on us and our children, if you enable them by your vote, I promise you, you don't have no mark on you from God. You're unmarked and you are open target. And if you don't believe me, you go to North Carolina and ask Mark Robinson. He'll tell you the exact same thing. We're buddies now. I'm his little buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Our last thing. I preach a little long because it's 9-11. Can I say one more thing? Amen. Let me get a bit of water. I just need to say one more thing because I know there's some people out here I'm just assuming you're mad. I'm not mad. Sister Connie, it's nice and humid up here. I'm loving this preaching and this humidity. Getting all sweaty. I told Mark Robinson's wife, Yolanda, I said, we got nice and humid for you when you came out to California. She said, I know. It feels just like home. But I know there's some people that are going to be mad, and when they get home tonight, they're going to be lying on their pillow looking up at the ceiling and say, that little Napoleon up there. <laughs> I knew he was going to get political. That little Napoleon, I knew it was going to happen. I just didn't know it was going to happen today, but I knew it. And I want you to understand, I agree with you. I did get a little bit political, but that's your prejudice. I think we talked a whole lot more about the Bible than we did political. Amen. As a matter of fact, I will give you my notes and you can count up all the Bible verses and you can compare how many times I said the word of God to the name Gavin Newsom and you'll be surprised. 
I'm not as much of a Napoleon as you think I am. <laughs> but I want you to understand. Um, Brother George and I are going out door knocking this coming Thursday to share the gospel with people. I understand that the solution is not political. The biggest problem with America today is America needs to be converted. Amen. Let me tell you what I'm talking Amen. about. Turn to Matthew chapter 18. Turn to Matthew chapter 18, if you will, please. These are our last verses, and I'm going to let you go. Yeah. I have lunch with Katarina and George. I've got to let you go. It's also NFL. Got to let big guy get out of here. Matthew 18, verse 2. And Jesus called a little child unto him, and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, except you be what? Converted. Converted. And become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Look at verse 4. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself, shall humble himself in the sight of God, as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Of heaven. Amen. Listen. America is in peril today because America is unconverted. America needs to be converted. America needs its innocence back. And the way we get our innocence back is to become like little children before our Heavenly Father. And let the power of the blood of Jesus that was shed and that purchased the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit for you and me to receive, let that purchased possession by His blood, the regenerating, transforming power of the Holy Spirit to come into our hearts and come into our lives and renew our innocence. So, like little children, we will flinch at abominations. We will say, commercial sex is so yucky, I, I can't stand to think about it. It's so terrible. Abortion is terrible. Gender confusion is terrible. But it starts with Holy Spirit conversion, the power of God saving us, giving us new hearts, new minds by the power of the Holy Spirit, making us again before our Heavenly Father as innocent little children. How many understand that? Amen. Amen. All right, please stand. The thing I like about you all, the thing I'm so proud about all of you for, is if Pam's girlfriends came to this church today and saw you, they would say, those Christians in California are tough. They're not like those wimpy Christians in Oregon. Those people sat there and they received the word of God. Even though it may not have been comfortable, they took it in. Pam's girlfriends would be impressed with this church, and I'm proud of you. It's culture shock to hear a guy get up and talk like this, because we've turned from the Bible. But as long as I'm here, we open the book, amen? Amen. We open it big. We take it long. We take it deep. Karen Navarro can tell you, this church used to be called Community Bible Church. We open the word. We don't apologize for it. God has kept us on this corner for 70 years because we open it up. We open it big. We open it deep with no apologies. And you come and you take it in. And so I believe today the angel is going through and I believe the angel is marking some of you all. Amen. You're getting the mark. Because you're ones who are going to leave here today and sigh and cry for the abominations. The rest of you, take a number and get in line. It's coming. There's a good chance if America doesn't repent, we're going to be hit by a nuclear bomb. Oh my God, yeah. There's a good chance if we don't repent. It's zero hour. We need the mark. Amen? Amen. Amen? Father, thank you for these people. And if there's anyone here...